Welcome, I'm Nandan Desai. Uh, today we're speaking to Anjali Tarapur from Housing Development Finance Corporation or HDFC. HDFC is India's largest mortgage lender and a pioneer of home lending in the country. Um, Anjali has been with HDFC since 1997 and she's currently the additional senior general manager for management services and investor relations. She's also the business responsibility officer at HDFC. Anjali's got a keen interest in macroeconomic analysis, housing finance, and ESG issues from a corporate perspective. She's assisted high-level committees constructed by the government of India on affordable housing and infrastructure finance. Currently, she's a member of the Confederation of Indian Industries National Council on Corporate Governance and its subgroup on ESG. Anjali, let me begin by thanking you for HDFCs and your, you and your team's support for our work on capital as a force for good. Um, and, and, you know, the purpose of this interview was really to understand a little bit more about HDFC's approach to sustainability and impact. Uh, so maybe I'll kick off with the first question, which is how, how does HDFC approach sustainability and impact? Could you talk a little bit about that? Thank you, Nandan, and thank you for inviting me here today. Over the last two or three years, we at HDFC have had the opportunity to interact with you and your team. And we know that uh, Ketan has been the anchor and key driver of capital as a force for good. It's been our privilege to have partnered with you all to be able to showcase what we are doing in the ESG space. So thank you so much. And uh, let me just give you a little background. You know, India, uh, HDFC is India's largest uh, housing finance company. We are the pioneers of housing finance in India. We were set up in 1977. So we've had 45 years of being in the housing finance industry. Uh, today, our loan book size is about $85 billion. And we've cumulatively financed about 10 million housing units so far. We believe that our core business in itself, is which is predominantly providing housing finance to individuals, and these are to individuals across all income uh, segments. So we do believe that our core business in itself fulfills a huge social objective. So essentially, in a country like India, the housing shortage is immense. Some of the unofficial estimates put the housing shortage as high as about 40 million units. Our mortgage to GDP ratio is also extremely low at about 11%. And when you look at peer countries, you can see mortgage to GDP ratios at about 20%. In the advanced economies, you're seeing it upwards of 60, almost ranging up to 90% in certain economies. So the market has a huge potential to grow. And for us at HDFC, we look at sustainability or we look at ESG as nothing but a simple narrative of what we do each day at HDFC. So just to give you a little bit of an example, when I mentioned that, you know, we look at providing housing finance solutions across all income segments, um, based on our disbursements last year, 10% in value terms and about 23% in volume terms were loans to economically weaker sections and low income groups. By this, I mean that the average loan size of an economically weaker segment would be about $12,000. The average housing loan for a low income segment would be about $24,000. And this compares to the All India average loan that HDFC gives, which stands at around $44 million. So we cover the entire spectrum by trying to provide housing finance solutions which are workable across all income ranges. But it's also important to look at housing beyond just income levels and to try and look at inclusivity as well. So out of the loans that we disbursed last year, almost about 64% were loans to first-time home buyers. These are genuine users of their homes. About 70% in value terms are loans to women. That means the women are owners of their property. And now why is this important? It's important that women have their ownership, the houses are registered in their names, and their property rights are recognized. Uh, we've also managed to grow a large rural housing loan book, which is giving loans to farmers, horticulturers, planters. We've been able to learn to assess their crop incomes and be able to fund the rural housing side as well. We have a niche 
product called HDFC Reach, which addresses the housing requirements of those from the informal sector. Now, in India, being such a vast country, it's all about reach, reach, and reach. That means our focus now is moving towards penetrating deeper geographies in order to reach out to more customers. And finally, I think sustainability is also aligning yourself with the government's vision. And the government of India had a vision of providing housing for all under its flagship program. And HDFC was one of the leaders under the program of the credit link subsidy scheme. This enabled customers from the low income groups and middle income groups to be able to get afford housing. It gave them a little helping hand through a subsidy and HDFC was the largest uh, number of had the largest number of beneficiaries under the credit link subsidy scheme. So we covered almost about 314,000 customers under this scheme. So that's really, you know, in yeah. sum and substance, what we are looking at in the uh, house affordable housing space. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting, Anjali, because I think your uh, HDFC's mission is clearly aligned very much with delivering sustainability and impact. And what is the uh, the the you know your specific strategy uh, which you're pursuing at the currently? Right. So, as a housing finance company, we are looking at sustainability. We first we have to look at it from the liabilities perspective because that's where you're raising the resources from. So what HDFC did is we raised certain lines of credit and recently we did a 1.5 billion loan, which was an international borrowing where there were two components. One was it was a social loan, which was for on lending for affordable housing. And there was another component of this 1.5 billion that we raised, which was for on lending for green housing. Uh, the focus now is really to be able to encourage more individuals to be able to opt for green housing. And we were raising lines of credit. So we have now raised lines of credit for green house where there are obligations to online for green housing from the National Housing Bank. We've raised it from multilateral agencies like IFC and Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. We've tapped the syndicated markets as well. And uh, besides looking at wholesale funding, we also thought it was important to have a certain component from our retail resources. So we have green deposits. We we have a product where we the on lending from retail depositors. These are savings from typically from you know a wide number of Indians. Either they could be retired or they could be you know keeping their savings in HDFC. And these are term deposits. Uh, it's a small portion still. We're still trying, but we said it was important to have that buy-in both at the from the wholesale segment as well as the retail segment. Now, on the asset side, what we've been doing is we've been trying to encourage more green housing. There are challenges today in India, less than 5% of the housing stock is green housing, but it is something that is gradually changing. We're doing a lot of work in advocacy. In fact, we have a, a memorandum of understanding tied up with the uh, IGBC, which is the India Green Buildings Council. And we're doing a lot of work in terms of leveraging our relationships that we've had with developers, getting in the whole ecosystem. Because when you look at housing, and you look at the construction sector, they're closely tied with each other. We are talking to developers to encourage them also to be able to opt for green housing. Of course, policies have to support you towards doing this. As you know, in India, land is a state subject. So we have to work with different state regulators, different state governments to be able to encourage more green housing. But the ecosystem is gradually working. It's going to take time to go through that process, but that's something that we've been doing. On the non-individual side, we've been mandating that, you know, at least certain part of our non-individual portfolio, which is largely lending to, uh, which is lease rental discounting, lending to corporates and lending to developers, because we need to fund the supply, which is construction finance. We're trying to do a lot more due diligence on the environmental and social uh, side. And uh, this is a something that we needed to do a lot of work with our own people to be able to understand, get their buy-in, that it's 
when you do an ENS due diligence, it isn't compliance, but you need to understand why it is good for the entire ecosystem. So these are some of the initiatives that we've been working towards. Of course, on our own operations, we've been trying to install more solar panels to be able to get a little more renewable energy. We've been doing a lot of climate conscious changes within our own infrastructure in our own offices. And it's been an interesting journey, but whatever we do in the sustainability space, we do recognize that it is going to be a work in progress and we have to constantly keep raising the bar for our own selves. Yeah, no, that's interesting. You talked a little bit about this earlier, um, but how, how do you think uh, sustainability and impact fits in with HDFC's broader business mission? Um, you know, and, and but but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, it comes back, you know, at the end of the day, Nandan, we are a single product company. So what we do in the housing space is itself what we do in the sustainability space. So for us at HDFC, sustainability doesn't sit outside in a separate bucket. It is very, very core and embedded in everybody's function within the organization, whether you're customer facing or, or whether you have a line function within the organization. So that's the way we position ourselves, but yes, it revolves around the entire housing space. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what's your vision, Anjali, for how you would like to develop uh, HDFC's approach uh, in terms of sustainability and impact? And how do you where do you see that heading over the future? Right. So, so Nandan, you know, in the Indian context, you have to understand that I would say due credit must go to the capital markets regulator, SEBI, that came out with the BRSR framework, which is the Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report Framework. Now, this framework is important because it is an indigenous framework. It works for Indian companies. And the framework is designed in a way where you can get good peer-to-peer -peer comp company um, comparatives. So it is going to take time. What the regulators had said that um, for FY22, it would be done on a voluntary basis for the companies, for the top thousand companies based on market capitalization. But from FY23 onwards, which is this financial year, it would be mandatory for the top thousand companies. Now, what HDFC did is we, two years in advance before it became mandatory, HDFC was the first housing finance company to publish its BRSR report. We did this voluntarily on two years ahead of schedule. I think it's important for uh, investors to also appreciate how the necessity to have sustainability frameworks that are more nuanced based on what's happening within the country, because countries are at different stages of uh, progress as far as sustainability is concerned. And uh, the framework is quite wide and encompassing. What I think is going to be the next big step for finance companies is going to be measuring financed emissions. You know, we've moved out from looking at scope one and scope two emissions. If we're going to look at the real impact, it's going to be on financed emissions. And that's something that, you know, we're trying to work ahead of schedule before it becomes mandatory. So you don't need to always depend on a regulatory framework, but it does help. I think the government of India has done a number of good initiatives, right from very simple homegrown ideas of what they're calling the LIFE program, which is Lifestyle for Environment, which is just getting the common man to be a lot more sensitive on sustainability issues. Yeah. Um, they've recently come out with a sovereign bond, green bond framework. In fact, they're as we speak right now, they have an auction that's going to be happening to raise resources for green infrastructure. Once the important part and what we really need to see now going forward is whether that greenium really translates. As of now, for AAA rated entities, I wouldn't say that uh, one is able to get that greenium. There's not a premium on raising green funding as yet. But if markets deepen further, led by the sovereign, I think it will be a huge game changer. Yeah, yeah. And Anjali, what are the biggest challenges that you face in delivering and aligning your business mission towards uh, sustainability? Right. So obviously, it starts with really um, 
at the regulatory side, it's how do we get more greenhouses to be built? Because, you know, you're off such a low base right now. And uh, some of the in, uh, measure institutions that we can use, for instance, now there's a real estate regulator at every uh, state level. We've got to be able to you every and every new project that gets uh, get that gets launched mandatorily needs to register with this real estate regulator. Now, what we've been trying to say is maybe it would be a good idea to get their buy-in, to be able to get the developers to be able to state whether they are, a certain project is going to have green fund uh, is going to be have a green rating. We need to do a lot more advocacy. And there has to be a sort of a carrot and stick approach. So there has to be some incentive for the developer to be able to build more green housing. Some of the state governments have already initiated that, where they would say that if the project, the residential project qualifies for green rating, then maybe they would be given some incentive like a higher FSI or certain concessions on their property taxes. This has to move at a pan-India level as well. And yeah. once that happens, once you get, uh, you know, for instance, in the UK now, there are these EPC certificates across all properties that are there. S something like this has to start, you know, but yeah. but it will happen. In fact, you know, one of the great examples that we keep giving is that about 20 years ago, there was no credit bureau in India. Now, State Bank of India, HDFC, uh, Dun & Bradstreet and TransUnion got together to start the first credit bureau in India. And at that time, you know, a lot of people were saying, should companies be shared, should banks or financial institutions be sharing customer data? Yeah. There were some institutions that hadn't even moved towards computerization. But 20 years from now, I think not a single loan does not go through the credit bureau. So data gets built up over a period of of time it needs an ecosystem it needs a regulatory environment to work with it and i think that is going to happen so india is on the cusp of setting out its green taxonomy i understand there's been a working group at the finance ministry level and once that comes in i think we will all have a clearer framework to work within yeah and that actually brings me to my last question which is how do you see the sustainability space evolving in india in the coming years and decades yeah. Well, India is really right now. It's not just everybody saying India is the bright spot right now, not just because we have the largest, uh, fastest growing major economy in terms of our GDP. But when you really look at it, look at the power of the middle class, look at the power that our di public digital infrastructure has given us to be able to get financial inclusion. So the Jam Trinity is something that has really worked well for India, which is linking, you know, the social security, which is the Aadhaar card, with the access to financial inclusion, bank accounts, with the access with the telephone, the mobile. Yeah. Put that together. And the government has come very, very clearly in support of a transition to a low carbon economy. So there is a lot of investments that are coming in into the renewable energy space, into green hydrogen, and there is a policy framework to support all this. So whether you're looking at the production link incentives coming in to support, whether it's on the EV batteries or whether you're looking at the solar panels, various components across, uh, the thrust, the policy thrust is in the right space. And I think most companies in India have recognized that sustainability has to be its core and has to be embedded in what a company does in its day-to-day -day processes. Yeah. So I would think for good projects, funding is available. We are not looking at any constraints as far as, you know, good projects are concerned. But in India, we're, we certainly need a lot more capital to support infrastructure, which now has to be built with parameters around sustainability. The two of them are inextricably linked. But in India, what we really need is patient long-term capital. And that's something that, you know, all state governments are going out and trying to attract greater long-term investments. Yeah. 
And that's uh, that's great. And thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights with us, Anjali. And thank you again for uh, you know yours and your teams and HDFC support for the Capital as a Force for Good initiative. And we look forward to your support in this year and the coming years as well. Thank you so much. And uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Take care. Bye-bye.